In a remote corner of the Alaska Peninsula, brown bears at Brooks River and Katmai National Park are currently making their final preparations for winter hibernation. At nearly the same latitude, only more than 2,000 miles or 3,200 3, kilometers east, polar bears wait on the, shore of, on the shore of Hudson Bay for the return of sea ice. Unlike the brown bears, who are at their fattest point of the year, polar bears are at their skinniest. As winter descends upon North America, we witness a tale of two ecosystems and the bears that call these places home. Hi everyone, my name is Mike Fitz. I'm the resident naturalist with explore.org and we've been watching and enjoying the scene of brown bears fishing for salmon at Brooks River in Katmai National Park all summer. But we're excited to partner once again with Polar Bears International to bring you live footage of the polar bears along the western shore of Hudson Bay near Churchill, Manitoba to explore the world of polar bears and how their biology and lifestyles contrast with brown bears. I'm joined by Elisa McCall. She is the Director of Conservation Outreach and a staff scientist with Polar Bears International. Elisa, thanks so much for joining me today. Hi, Mike. We are so excited to kick off polar bear season with you. Yeah, I always look forward to uh, my conversations with the staff at Polar Bears International to to help me learn more about the the bears that call the Arctic home. And if anyone is curious about uh, brown bears and polar bears and how their lifestyles and biology uh, differ, um, you can drop those questions in the comments. I know Elisa is going to be working hard during the broadcast mm -hmm. to not only provide her insight, but also to monitor yeah. those questions. So we'll probably try to answer a few of those during the broadcast today. Before we start though, Elisa, um, can you just tell us a little bit more about Polar Bears International and its mission? Absolutely. So Polar Bears International is the only nonprofit that is solely dedicated to conserving wild polar bears. And our mission is to ensure the long-term survival of polar bears and their Arctic sea ice habitat. And we do that through a mix of research, education, advocacy, and media. So we're so excited to be with you today. And we're so excited that it's the fall because that means it's the annual polar bear migration in Churchill, Manitoba. And this is kind of one of the main bases of Polar Bears International, if not the absolute main base. We have a couple houses there, a bunch of our staff are there. I'm heading there Monday. And of course we have our polar bear cams there. And you can see behind me, this is the Tundra Buggy One polar bear cam, but we have multiple cams throughout the tundra and at this time of the year before Hudson Bay starts to freeze up the bears start moving toward the coast and we get some incredible views which we'll talk a little bit more about soon but we couldn't be more happy to bring polar bears to you today live. We also have um, someone who is joining us um, for some maybe some live uh, commentary from the tundra, and I think we'll get yeah. to him a, a little bit later on in the broadcast. So look for those um, those live scenes to you coming to you live from from uh, from Hudson Bay. But as I mentioned earlier, Elisa, uh, Katmai National Park uh, in Alaska and Churchill are located at, at basically the same latitude, about forty five degrees north of Earth, Earth's equator. Yet these places harbor much different habitats, and this is one of the things that I find kind of fascinating about um, you know polar bears and brown bears and how they're able to exist. Um, in different plains and sometimes the same environments, but sometimes much different environments. Uh, and while Katmai has, you know, of course, plenty of tundra and glaciers at high elevations, I think this region uh, experiences a relatively temperate environment due to the warming effect of the Pacific Ocean, which is to the south and east, mm -hmm. and then uh, the, to the Bering Sea that's to the west. And lowland habitats in Katmai are thick with small trees and, and, and tall shrubs. Uh, the landscape is also rich with an interconnected system of rivers and lakes. And these really create perfect habitat um, for, uh, for sockeye salmon. And in Katmai, especially the central portion of the National Park where Brooks River is located, salmon are the most abundant high calorie foods for brown bears. And this allows bears in Katmai to live at very high densities. In fact, this year we saw more than 100 individual bears uh, along the three kilometer long Brooks River. And uh, this summer, we saw 30 to 40 bears fishing at Brooks Falls at the same time. So in Katmai, brown bears are found virtually everywhere, but they're especially concentrated along salmon streams. In Churchill, though, and western Hudson Bay, how do those areas um, differ compared to what we find in Katmai? 
Yeah, the Churchill area is so unique. And in fact, researchers come from all over the world to study a variety of things in this region. It's not only about the polar bears, even though that's what we're focusing on. Churchill has an overlapping of three different huge ecosystems. There's the marine environment with Hudson Bay, there's the tundra environment, and then there's the forest environment. So these polar bears that live in this region are experiencing a wide variety of ecosystems, even though polar bears absolutely rely on sea ice, that is their habitat. But in areas like Hudson Bay, that sea ice habitat is seasonal. So during the summer, there's no sea ice. They're gone during the winter out on that ice hunting seals on a very productive Hudson Bay. But in the summer, we get to watch these polar bears because there's no ice to hunt on. They come onto shore and they hunker down. So here it's not uncommon to see polar bears lounging in wildflowers or hanging out in the forest, which is pretty unique uh, across the polar bears range. So this Churchill region is absolutely spectacular. And maybe this is actually a great time to pop on over to Dave on Tundra Buggy One. Dave is the buggy driver for today. And maybe Dave could just give us a little sneak peek into what he's seeing out on the tundra. Dave is a fabulous naturalist that's worked all across the Arctic and Antarctic. So he's got great perspective and he can tell us a bit about what these bears are doing because unlike Katmai, the polar bears here, like you mentioned earlier, they haven't eaten for a while. They're being a little bit lazy right now, but that also makes for good viewing. So thanks Dave for joining us today. breezy here in Churchill, Manitoba today. I think it's um, blowing at around 50 kilometers per hour, gusting to 70. So that's like, you know, blowing at 30, gusting 50. Uh, so it's kind of what we expect this time of year. Um, to say that the bears are, are lazy, uh, these ones have barely twitched. We've been sitting on these bears for about, uh, <laughs> about three hours now, and they've barely lifted an eyebrow, you know? They've barely even lifted their heads to say, to acknowledge that they're sleeping, so. They are sleeping. They are moving. You know, they're not. Uh, they're not bear carcasses. You know, um, but no, we've been. Uh, these are the first bears we saw today. There's a few other machines operating out here in this uh, part of the coast, and there's a few little groups of machines. So I can only assume that they're looking at other bears or individual individuals out there. Um, yeah, but these. Um, this is the first set of mum females and cubs that I've seen. Um, since we've been uh, operating here in on buggy one, but, uh, the bears are starting to. Uh, one of them's just lifted its head right now, so um, hopefully we'll see that. <laughs> There's a two or three minute delay on the on the camera, but uh, one of them's just lifted its head. So, but no, the bears are around. Oh. It's been quite quiet. It's been really quiet as far as bears mm. are concerned. Um, they seem to move around a bit when it gets cooler, and we we've barely even had a frost. Now it's October 19 today. You know, we had a couple of very light frosts uh, late September, and uh, there's barely been a snowflake since. So that's not something we typically see here. So hopefully in the next few days, we see some some of the white stuff coming out of the sky, and then we see some bears start to move around. Thanks, Dave. It sure is a contrast to Katmai, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I think uh, we I've, I've had limited experience visiting Churchill, and I... Uh, I, I still want to thank, you know, Polar Bears International for, for hosting me a few years ago. And it was such a stark difference in, in habitats between mm -hmm. what I'm used to seeing with brown bears in Katmai National Park. Again, a, 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 a mountainous landscape, interconnected lakes and streams, ample salmon runs using um, that area. And the, and the brown bears right now just continuing to get fat on salmon. Uh, so if you, you can, you, and people can still tune into the brown bear cams on Explore.org and watch bears still fishing for salmon. Uh, but we're seeing you know, great differences in habitat between these two different bear populations, uh, as well as uh, we can use these, I think these different cameras to look at their different adaptations. And while brown and polar bears are very closely related species, they display, display considerable differences in appearance and diet and habitat. So I think maybe now is a great opportunity to take a few minutes to, minutes to discuss what defines these two bear species. And maybe we can start with appearance. At first, uh, you know, we could just talk about how brown bears are aptly named. Uh, their fur is often just plain brown, but it also ranges from blonde uh, to dark brown. And while it often provides some camouflage, their fur really isn't specialized for its habitat. And that's, I think, maybe a big difference to start with, with how brown and polar bears are different. Elisa, what about polar bear fur? How is it um, uh, different from 
from what I would consider, you know, quote unquote, normal bear fur that you'd find on a brown bear. Yeah, polar bear fur is quite specialized. So I've got actually a piece of it here and I'll hold it up to the camera. So of course it's quite thick and it looks white. It helps them blend in with their sea ice habitat and probably helps them sneak up on seals a little bit. Though it looks white to us, it's not actually white. Polar bear fur is transparent and mostly hollow. And we think that the hollowness helps them trap warm air against their bodies. Of course, their fur is very insulative. So right against the skin, they've got a very, very thick, dense layer like us wearing a woolly sweater. And their top layer of fur are these longer, more guard-like hairs that are going to whisk away the weather and the water a little bit more. Now the fur is a great insulator when it's dry. When the bear is swimming, polar bears of course rely on their body fat to keep them warm because wet fur is not that great of an insulator. But polar bear fur, very thick, very beautiful. It does pick up all sorts of light because it is clear. So for viewers of the cam, if you are watching the cam during a sunset, for example, you might see some pink or orange polar bears out there. And it's truly a beautiful, a beautiful sight when you get to see them under yeah. the, the low level Arctic sunlight. Uh, you know, beyond their physical appearances and in, in their fur, I mean, one of the greatest differences between these two species is diet. Uh, even though cat mice bears are highly reliant on salmon, as a species, brown bears are generalist omnivores. And what that means is basically they're like us in that sense. They'll eat and survive on a great diversity of foods. In fact, most brown bear populations in North America and Asia and Europe are largely vegetarian. So we even see cat mice bears eating a lot of grass, sedge, berries, um, and in the Rocky Mountains, the yearly diet of many grizzly bears uh, is more than 90% plant matter. So brown bears are adapted to survive on roughage, you know, kind of slightly better than other carnivores. I mean, they're members of the carnivore uh, group of mammals. They don't have like a multi-chambered stomach or other specialized organs to help them digest plant matter. But compared to something like a wolf or a lynx, uh, brown bears have a slightly elongated digestive tract to help them digest plants. So they can live on a wide variety of foods and they will eat a ton of different things. In contrast though, at least the polar bears are adapted for a much more specialized diet as I understand it. Absolutely. Polar bears have something we could call a hyper carnivorous diet. Uh, some even call them lipovores because polar bears absolutely depend on eating fat. They are a fat eating bear, really. And that's because that blubber that seals have is one of the most energy dense foods on the planet. And if you imagine sustaining the biggest bear body on the planet, being the most mobile four legged animal on the planet and having to walk over that harsh Arctic sea ice for months, if not a whole year of your life, you need a lot of energy to stay powered and healthy. So polar bears absolutely rely on eating seal blubber. Uh, we actually did have a question from Indy Dunes about hyperphagia. Absolutely, before that sea ice melts in the summer, polar bears do go through a period of hyperphagia when seals are pupping. Seal pups are an easy to eat little fat popsicle out there on the ice and polar bears absolutely will gorge themselves to get enough body fat to make it through that summer or that period of lesser food. Polar bears can gain hundreds of pounds in a short amount of time. They're gonna live off that body fat and it's very important that they eat a lot of seals as much as they can. And as you were talking about the digestive tract, yeah, they've kind of gone the other way with their digestive tract. So although polar bears split from brown bears, one of the many different genetic differences that polar bears have is in their guts as well. Polar bears actually cannot process proteins and carbohydrates nearly as efficiently as other bears. They really, really do need that fat. And in fact, when eating is really good during that hyperphagia period, if they are getting a lot of fat, we can see out there seals just stripped of their blubber and the meat left because polar bears just want to go find more fat. So the meat's left for the gulls and the foxes and whoever's out on that sea ice. So polar bears are a fat eating bear, very highly specialized. And Mike, I did quickly want to circle back. We had a quick question about bear fur, sorry, from Joe Beer. Sure. Uh, he was asking if there's ever a time where polar bears are a little more brown. Do they go through these kind of uh, changes in there for like brown bears maybe can be a little lighter or darker at different times of the year. Polar bears generally just stay the same white. They don't really go through uh, changes in their shades of fur, individual bears anyway, but they do go through a molting period in around the spring. They have a bit of a molt and they'll get rid of that other um, fur that they don't need anymore and get some fresh fur. So that's the only thing they do. Thanks, Mike. Hey, no problem. Uh the, yeah, speaking of hyperphagia, I mean, a lot of the bears uh, in North America 
or brown, brown and black bears are experiencing that right now. So the timing is mm -hmm. a little bit different um, compared to polar bears. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the brown bears at, at Katmai are, are focused right now on eating as much food as they can before they go into winter, winter hibernation. And that, um, that process is a, is a long sort of like drawn out process for them. It's not like flipping on a switch. So I imagine maybe it's the same with, uh, with polar bears. But speaking of the diet that you were talking about um, mm -hmm. and in polar bears being like a hyper carnivore in a sense, uh, brown bears, when we look at their teeth, uh, you know, they still possess big canine teeth. They're pretty good at, you know, capturing prey when it's available to them, but they have slightly flattened molars to help them chew vegetation. Are we seeing um, specialized adaptations in polar bear teeth that is uh, that that points towards like a diet that's highly reliant on, on hunting seals? Yeah, so polar bears actually have less molar surface area than brown bears because you know, they simply don't need to be chewing that sort of vegetation. Their teeth, of course, we see these big carnivore teeth, but they're not necessarily specialized just for seals. They don't really need to be because seals are pretty squishy and can be killed also in combination with a whack of the paw. But one interesting thing is that polar bear skulls, they've become a little flattened compared to brown bears. That's going to help them get in and out of the seal holes to pull those seals up. But it has also translated into slightly weaker jaw structure overall. So polar bears don't actually have the same bite strength that we might see in brown bears, because again, their prey is generally pretty squishy compared to what brown bears are eating. Still very strong, oh, don't get me wrong. <laughs> that, that's fascinating too. One of the things that I've noticed yeah. about watching like polar bears on the cameras is that their facial structure really doesn't seem to differ as much as what you see on a, on a brown bear. You know, when you watch the brown bear cams, you see a, a wide variety of, of skull shapes and facial structures, you know, short muscles, long muscles, wide faces, narrow faces. Uh, but it, it doesn't really seem like the, you know, polar bears have that, that diversity um, in, their, in their skull structure. Maybe that's uh, an adaptation to, to help them hunt seals and, and capture prey on the, on the sea ice. I'm not sure. Yeah, it might be. And that's another reason, another difference between the brown bear cams and the polar bear cams, I think, is these polar bears aren't as easily instantly recognizable as many of the brown bears are. So we really are relying on if a polar bear happens to have a particular scar or something unique about it to tell who it is. Otherwise, it's it's hard for us to give them names like you guys are able to do over there in Alaska. And let's talk about habitat now. Uh, brown bears, you know, yeah. occupy diverse terrestrial habitats. And prior to European colonization, if we were just to look at North America, for example, uh, brown bears lived virtually everywhere on the western half of the continent, um, from the Arctic tundra to coastal California, to the prairies of the mid-continent, even to the deserts of what we now uh, call the southwest U.S. and northern Mexico. And one way, is, uh, one way that brown bears are well adapted to living in these places is the shape of their claws. And I think we have a, a good picture to bring up of of their claws. Their, their front claws are really like, uh, are, they're several inches long and they're adapted. They really act like excavators. They help them dig up uh, tubers and roots, underground truffles, ground squirrels where they find them. And even on Katmai's Pacific coast, clams. And some bears love to harvest clams from the mudflats at low tide. Their claws aren't really designed for climbing trees, but they are an all purpose tool for getting at foods that reside under the surface of the soil. Uh, and I, I like looking at the different, uh, you know, ways that brown bear claws or, or uh, contrast with other bear species. So Elisa, can you talk about polar bear claws right now and how those might be adapted for their environment? Absolutely. So yeah, polar bear claws also very specific to what they need. So I've got a claw here in front of my face. So you can see that this guy's very thick a little bit shorter than a brown bear and sharp. So this is a brown bear claw underneath compared to the polar bear claw on top. This polar bear claw is much more suited for giving some traction on ice and for digging into those slippery seals and pulling them out of the water. So polar bears often will hunt at a seal hole, wait very patiently, and they need to be really quick when that seal comes up for air. They're gonna dive in and try to grab that seal with their teeth and their claws. So. Yeah, it's, it's not as well suited as the brown bear one for terrestrial living, that's for sure, but polar bears have perfect claws for living on sea ice. And these bears also uh, differ in their yearly patterns um, across, you know, not only summer, but of course into the fall and to the winter. And right now, brown bears are 
getting ready for hibernation. It's the event that they've been, they've been spending months preparing for. And while hibernating, they don't eat, they don't drink, they don't urinate, they don't defecate. They're surviving solely on their body fat. And that's why they've been working so hard to gain body mass through the summer. And winter is also when mother brown bears give birth to cubs. So they're born in midwinter, right around the end of January or early February. Uh, Elisa, though, in any given year, most polar bears don't seem to enter a den. Um, so can you talk about which polar bears utilize dens and why and why that is? Yeah, polar bears do not hibernate. And the only bears that we find in dens for any period of time are mothers that are giving birth to their young. So right now in the Western Hudson Bay area, the, where these Churchill bears are, uh, any pregnant females will be entering a den if they're not already there. They're going to give birth over the winter and exit that den in approximately March. So if you do the math, these females have come off the ice in June, July, and they're not getting back out there to eat until March. So they are not eating for up to eight months, which is pretty crazy. But females in this region are also interesting in the fact that they will reuse dens because many of their dens, well, their dens are in the permafrost uh, peat of the Western Hudson Bay region. So these are earth dens that these polar bears are using. We see them sometimes up the riverbanks, uh, inland, and the moms have to travel from inland out to the coast uh, to get out there to hunt. In other parts of the polar bears range, the polar bears may den on sea ice, but here we know where the denning region is. It's in, generally in Wapusk National Park, which is where our Cape Cams are in Churchill. And it's a very, very special place in the world for polar bear denning. And when do they start that migration period? Um, you know, we didn't, I didn't include this in the outline, so I'm just uh, throwing this out to you. But when do they start <laughs> yeah. um, going towards their denning sites? Is that kind of like a long trek for them um, or are they you know, just doing it over a few days. You know, it really seems to depend on the female. They're all such individuals that they're all doing something a little bit different. Some don't den all that far from the coast and they might come off the sea ice in June or July and kind of spend their time meandering into where their denning area is. Other bears might trek there and it takes them a few days or potentially even a week, depending on their speed to get to their denning site that might be quite inland. They are quite variable, um, but generally they don't go too much farther than uh, the outer edge of Wapas National Park. But yeah, we see a lot of different strategies, which is one of the many things that make polar bears so fascinating. Yeah, certainly. And, and bears in general, I think we can we can know that yeah. there are individuals amongst <laughs> yeah. the population. I think that's one of the really yeah. fascinating things about the, this this group of animals. And also something that I find really interesting about, um, you know, when we're talking about denning habitats of these these different animals and how only polar bear mo mothers with, who are giving birth will go into a den, brown bears aren't obligate hibernators, so they don't need to go into a den to survive. Uh, and in what that means is if they have access to food, then they can be active year round. So they're really not avoiding cold weather. They're mostly just kind of avoiding famine right. when they go into their hibernation mode. And since polar bears are descended from brown bears, uh, it seems like maybe they, you know, retain the ability to remain active year round uh, as, as well. And this, in my opinion, may have allowed polar bears to evolve to exploit feeding opportunities on the sea ice. I don't think it's too hard to envision a scenario during like sometime during the last ice age where you had brown bears, you know, encountering a lot of sea ice and then some brown bears or maybe multiple populations of, of brown bears just kind of figured out, hey, we can make a living if we just uh, head out onto that ice instead of, you know, wandering into the um, into a den um, and, and sleeping it off for a few months. So I, th I find that aspect of, of their biology and, and their natural history and and evolution to be um, quite fascinating. I'm also curious, Elisa, about one other thing on this topic. Um, you know, there, uh, th and that is the the bear's ability to endure prolonged famine, um, like that experienced by brown bears during hibernation. I'm wondering if that might serve polar bears in other ways. So while hibernating, um, bears metabolize brown bears metabolize body fat, and it's one of the byproducts of that, that is metabolic water. So that's what they use to keep them hydrated inside of the den. In winter, though, uh, when polar bears are out living on sea ice, um, maybe if they find a, an open lead or something like that, the only liquid water available to them is salty. So are polar bears using like a similar mechanism to keep them hydrated? They're able to kind of metabolize fat in that way, or are they just just eating a lot of uh, 
snow and ice. Yeah, polar bears can eat snow and ice, but it's not that efficient to then warm that up in their stomach. So yes, they absolutely can met met metabolize their own water. And that's made easier by their high fat diet. It's easier to metabolize that fat straight into water when they need it. And I will say there's quite a bit of interesting research going on right now about the limits to which polar bears can fast, uh, because it is something we're quite concerned about. Already these Western Hudson Bay polar bears are spending a month on land longer than their ancestors did just a, well, just a few decades ago, really. And we know that they will continue to spend longer periods of time on land. And what is that limit? Even if you can metabolize your own water. We used to think that these bears might have a metabolic slowdown in the summer while they're on land, but now we know that's not true and that they're losing about a kilogram of body fat per day when they're on land in this region. So their limits of fasting are something of great interest to us. Uh, we know that there is a limit, and we are watching to see what's going on with the sea ice and these bears and how long they have to spend on land. Because although these bears can eat berries and eggs like their brown bear ancestor, and they will absolutely scavenge, again, they need that high fat diet of seals that they can only get via sea ice. So yeah, this fasting topic is really interesting, uh, whether it's food or water that we're talking about. And you know, uh, you mentioned how some mother polar bears will spend maybe as much as eight months fasting before they head mm -hmm. back out to sea ice with their newborn cubs. And I think maybe this is a good chance to talk about uh, just a briefly about the family life of polar bears. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wanted to know about um, when mother polar bears separate from their cubs, but somebody else actually dropped into the chat. Um, I think Brenda was wondering Perfect. if polar bears also have more than one cub at a time like uh, like brown bears. So um, what about their family life? How long do mother bears maybe stay with their cubs and um, when do they separate? Yeah, so mothers usually have between one and three cubs. Last year we saw triplets, which was pretty spectacular, but usually we're going to see one or two cubs with mom. And those cubs will stay with their mom for up to about two and a half years. And they have a lot of learning to do in those two and a half years about how to navigate that sea ice. Uh, but after two and a half years, the cubs will wean. They're now considered subadults until they turn adults at five years old. So they've got a couple years of subadults. And mom will go out to try to find a new mate and start all over again. And that largely parallels what, with what we see in brown bears. So in Katmai, with mm -hmm. um, a lot of salmon available to bears, we see mother bears typically with uh, litter sizes that average two to three cubs, but the varia there's variation in there. It can be just one cub or sometimes in rare instances, uh, four cubs in the same family. And mother bears in Katmai usually keep their cubs for two to three summers, and then they'll go into the den with them one mm -hmm. more time uh, and then separate from them in the beginning of uh, mm. or, uh, late spring or, or very early summer, right around the time that the mating season starts uh, to ramp up. Uh, and we all, often get you know, many questions about this on the brown bear cam, and, and Elisa, I'm sure you get questions about this as well, about uh, their, the, the interrelationship between brown and polar bears. Mm. In fact, um, we did have a question about um, are, are brown bears and polar bears, have they ever interacted with one another? Um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about this. How closely related are brown and polar bears? And do we see them sort of interacting? Yeah, brown and polar bears absolutely interact. And in fact, Churchill is a place where we can find polar brown and black bears all in one spot, which is pretty cool. But we do know that polar bears and brown bears overlap in the range, especially in the higher Arctic. And generally, um, we think that brown bears can be a little more aggressive. Of course, tundra grizzlies are pretty aggressive. And in areas like where there's whalebone piles up north, uh, we'll see a group of polar bears eating the carcass. And then one brown bear can come in and kind of spook away quite a few polar bears. So there's some really interesting interactions that these two species have. And of course, one question we get quite often is, can they hybridize together? Do they ever mate? They split off, polar bears split from brown bears roughly 400,000 years ago. Um, there's not a great fossil record for polar bears because they tend to die out on the sea ice and their remains are at the bottom of the ocean. But the best genetic data we have right now is roughly 400,000 years ago. And we do know that during this time, there have been um, gene, there has been gene flow between the species. And there's probably been a few hybrid, more than a few hybridization events, but it's not all that common 
We're not going to create a brand new bear species by any stretch. The most recent uh, event that we know about in the Canadian high Arctic a few years ago now, it was one female polar bear that mated with a couple different brown bears, two different brown bears on different occasions. She had a couple different litters of hybridized bears and those half and half bears went on to then mate as well. So we had um, what, one quarter grizzly, three quarter polar bears out there for a while. It was just this little pocket, this small event tracked Okay. <laughs> Sorry for the pause there, uh, everybody. We'll, we'll work to get Elisa back here in just a moment. But yeah, she, um, you know, she was talking about that situation where there were polar, brown and polar bear hybrids uh, documented in the Canadian Arctic uh, several years ago, but I think we're unlikely to, yeah, to, like she was saying, to see some sort of like weird hybrid bear roaming the landscape out there in in large numbers it's probably just going to be isolated events and contact between brown and polar bears is uh, becoming increasingly likely as the climate continues to warm and this is i think the maybe the last sort of major topic that elisa and i wanted to cover during our broadcast today this year arctic sea ice is once again well below 20th century averages and that's a trend that will worsen as uh, as the climate continues to warm in fact arctic sea ice extent this year was the 12th lowest on record in 2020 it was the the second lowest on on record so one might look at that as an improvement from 2020 to 2021 but remember this is another sign of a rapidly changing arctic we have 43 years of satellite data records for Arctic sea ice in the last 15 years. So from 2007 to 2021, those are the lowest 15 minimum sea ice extents in that record. So certainly a, it's it's cause for concern. Um, I think we still have Dave available to us. And Dave, maybe if I can, I can uh, toss a couple of these questions that I had for Elisa uh, to you. Um, if you wanted to perhaps answer how um, this question, how will the loss of sea ice affect polar bears? How is that, how are, um, what are we seeing now and maybe what might we see in the future? Yeah, so uh, back to what was mentioned earlier on, you know, um, spending less time on the ice isn't great. The, the bears don't have that access to that calorie rich diet on shore. You know, they, they do eat other things. I know at least I mentioned they eat, you know, berries and other stuff, but they haven't got those terrestrial tools like, uh, they haven't got the claws to, to forage in. and also locally on land and most of the arctic close to the arctic shoreline there really isn't a lot even for the terrestrial ecosystems you know the the arctic foxes the the barren ground grizzly bears they're in they're few and far between and there's not a lot of terrestrial resources for the polar bear to adapt to and it those adaptation tools that were mentioned you know the the brown bears got all of these environments that it lives in from mountain tops to forests to rivers and deserts and the polar bears found on the sea ice or on the beaches and rocks immediately next to where the sea ice is. Um, certainly um, spending more time in a terrestrial environment is, is just not good for a bear, not good for a polar bear. And I think we can look to brown bears um, for uh, ev further evidence to support um, that, uh, that line of reasoning because uh, on plant-based diets, or at least with brown bear populations that are e eating largely plants, um, you know, they're, they're smaller overall, they can't grow as big, um, and they exist at lower densities than what you find in places like Katmai National Park, where uh, brown bears have access to just a lot of meat. Um, so meat is important, and a lot of it is uh, especially necessary for, for large bears to make a living. Uh, and, and I think, you know, again, when we're thinking about um, how polar bears are spending more and more time on sea ice, yeah, it's just going to be a, a really rough transition for them. And most of them aren't going to be able to, to make that. It seems that maybe you're going to be, there will be a, a few probably in the high, high Arctic that could luck out. But, you know, along the shores of Hudson Bay, it is certainly um, reason to, con uh, to be concerned on that. And Lisa, um, now that you're back, you know, we were talking about, um, you know, the changes to sea ice and climate change and how reduced sea ice is going to affect uh, polar bears. And looking back to, you know, what I've learned about brown bears, it seems like that brown bears, at least from a study done on captive brown bears at Washington State University, 
That study found that brown bears, females with less than 20% body fat at the time of denning do not give, give birth. And, and bears are the only animals that give birth to lactate while they're denning. So we talked about how lack of sea ice will make it harder for polar bears to make a living. Will this be uh, more pronounced for mother polar bears than, than like a, let's say an adult male? I think so. It will have a, a huge impact population wise when you are impacting the reproductive members of the species in terms of females and cubs. So we know that the smallest female that can give birth that, that we know of is about 420 pounds. So that's about the size that a female needs to successfully have a cub. And we do also know that female polar bears in the area around Churchill, Western Hudson Bay bears are getting smaller over time and there's more bears approaching that limit. So as we lose sea ice, bears simply lose access to their prey and loss of access to food is going to impact any animal on this earth, including humans. And if you have that sustained over time, of course, over time, you are going to not be as healthy, not as heavy, your body size will go down, fewer cubs, and we see over time population decline. So we do know that this population has declined over 30% since the 1980s already. And we're seeing similar things in the neighboring Southern Hudson Bay. And yeah, once you lose access to food, moms, cubs, and all the bears in the population are going to be affected. And we do know that Hudson Bay sea ice is changing fairly rapidly in context with the rest of the Arctic, which is also warming faster than other places on earth. But we expect to see major changes in Hudson Bay by mid-century. And we really already are seeing major changes. So we're so fortunate to be able to watch these bears now, to watch some healthy bears that had a good year um, because these changes are long-term, but we are seeing things play out right now. And you know, I, I think, some similar, I have some th similar thoughts uh, about, you know, brown bears in Katmai National Park. We're so fortunate to be able to see, you know, Katmai right now just operating on all cylinders. It's an ecosystem that's operating yeah. at its fully realized potential yeah. with right. record numbers of salmon runs and high densities of bears and very fat bears. But climate change is likely to affect those bears as well. There's really no place on earth that is going to be untouched by this process. Um, and heat waves could easily disrupt the salmon run in Katmai. Uh, on the west coast of the United States, this uh, and 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 um, in British Columbia and um, southwestern Canada this year, that that big heat wave earlier in the summer was a disaster uh, for salmon and many of the other uh, plants and animals you know that call that area home. Uh, and climate change is also going to exert exert a strong influence on the oceans. Um, the oceans are going to acidify. Uh, that can disrupt marine food webs, um, probably in the Arctic as well as in the North Pacific. And remember, when we're talking about brown bears and Katmai and their reliance on salmon, that is, that's where salmon are gaining most of their body mass. It's out in the open ocean. So if the salmon aren't surviving as well in the open ocean in the future, then that's certainly going to have an impact on brown bears across much of the West Coast of, of North America. Uh, but I think there's reason to be hopeful as well. If, if we can get our act together and focus on um, addressing the, the climate crisis, and I know that's something that um, Dave and Elisa, that Polar Bears International works very hard to get the word out on. Absolutely. The good thing about the climate crisis is that we know exactly what the issue is. As humans are burning fossil fuels, we're releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And at regular levels, it's okay at carbon dioxide carbon dioxide acts like a heat trapping blanket, but we've pumped too much into the atmosphere. We're burning too many fuels and we're thickening this heat trapping blanket. And of course, ice does not like heat. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, but the good news is we have the alternate energy sources to fossil fuels. We have the solar technology. We have the wind technology. We need to just be rolling the these things out at a larger level. We need to get our leaders on board, look at what our communities are doing and make a big shift together. We can also use the fossil fuels we are burning more efficiently uh, and we need to talk about it with each other. So that's why we're encouraging people to get out there, to vote, talk to your friends, family, have students talk to each other. You know, this needs to be this big push now. We can all do this together and we are really hopeful all season, we'll be talking about ways people can get involved. We are going to have delegates at the next COP conference, which is in Glasgow, Scotland this year. And we're really excited to let people know how they can get involved with polar bear conservation because everything that's good for polar bears is good for people too, which is one more very cool thing about this animal. Yeah, we certainly can't separate, I don't think, the fate of polar bears from the fate of people. Yeah. Uh, and I think we have a lot to look forward to, um, you know, with with the brown bear or excuse me, the polar bear cams 
uh, yeah, this summer and learning more about these amazing creatures. So what what can we expect to see on the polar, polar bear cams and, and buggy one going forward this fall? Yeah, we are so excited. So we did get a question earlier about, are there still belugas there? I believe the belugas are gone now. Of course, we do run the beluga cam in the summer, uh, but we're mostly gonna be focusing on the polar bears now. But over the years, we have just seen so many incredible things. You never know what you're gonna see. Pretty sure we will see more bears showing up soon. Maybe see the tundra become white with a bit of snow. We in the past have seen hares, foxes, even a wolverine, uh, all sorts of cool birds. And Dave, what do you expect to see out there this fall? Uh, certainly more bears um, as the yeah. temperatures <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. So more and more movement. Um, yeah. We, you know, I haven't seen an Arctic fox since this time last year, you know, and I've traveled all over this landscape all of through the winter months and through the summer and I haven't seen any Arctic foxes. So, and nobody seems to have seen them locally. So it's a little bit of a concern. I wonder where they are. Um, Arctic hares seem quite plentiful. Um, and that may be due mm -hmm. to not being many Arctic foxes around. Um, but there seems to be lots of Arctic hares around, uh, but Arctic foxes, I, I don't know where they are. There's still a few lingering birds. Um, we've got uh, two Canada geese uh, this morning, um, and there's a couple of mallard ducks. Um, so they, most of those are long gone. And back to the belugas, you know, about a week ago, there was still a couple of dozen belugas. Oh. Out of the 4,000 or so, there's a couple of dozen, but maybe this storm will get rid of them. It, you know, it's not uncommon to see a few stragglers well into October, but it's getting late in the month. They should probably head on out if they don't want to be locked in ice. Um, but no, I'm expecting this um, a blanket of snow by the end of this week and um, and more movement, some more bears, hopefully females with lots of cubs. Yeah, and we might get to see some sparring as well. And for those of you that maybe haven't seen that before, that's when generally the males will kind of play fight, usually when the temperatures get a little cooler. And that's always a lot of fun to watch. There's an example of it there. So yeah that's one of our favorite things to see out there usually not until maybe a little closer to november though so keep your eyes peeled it's definitely i think you know prime time for polar bears um, as we see yeah. fewer and fewer bears at brooks river uh, at th this time of the year they're moving off to their denning sites or maybe they know one last pocket where they can find some salmon but it's it's the time of the year for them to really start to conserve their energy while polar bears are just kind of ramping up for their active season. So it's it's a great contrast overall. And um, I'd like to thank Dave from uh, from who's coming to us live from Buggy One. And of course, uh, Elisa yeah. for uh, joining us on this broadcast today to talk about um, the wild ways of brown and polar bears and how their lives differ. If you wanna know more about polar bears and their lifestyles and the work of Polar Bears International, please go to polarbearsinternational.org. It's really like the first place that I go to when I have a polar bear question. Um, if it, it's that, that should be your first stop, I think for sure. And then if you want to watch the polar bears, of course, at any time, just go to explore.org slash polar bears and you can look at, at live footage. So, uh, so Dave and Elisa, thanks so much uh, for joining me today. Thank you so You're much, welcome. Mike. It was great to be here. And I should say, we do have more live chats. We have a live chat every week and we have our Tundra Connections webcasts, which are more aimed at students and teachers, but anyone from the public is welcome to join. We've got the schedule posted on our website and I believe hopefully on explore.org as well. And if not, we'll get it up there. Thanks for the moderators for always doing a great job posting that. And we will have Dave or Kyron or BJ or KT or whoever staff is out there for the day, out every single day during polar bear season to live stream and answer questions. So we're always here to talk about polar bears. Thanks for having us today. Yeah, I'm looking forward to everything uh, coming up this fall. So have a great day. Future generations of people and polar bears depend on the decisions and plans that we make today. The key to getting the climate back to functioning the way it should and to preserving a future for polar bears across the Arctic is to move away from using fossil fuels for energy altogether. The most important thing we can do is vote with the climate in mind to let our leaders know we support a swift transition to renewable energy sources. In the meantime, we can directly participate in and learn more about our local and regional renewable energy options. We can all make a difference outside our own households by influencing where our energy comes from. 
We hope you leave here feeling inspired and return home to leverage your voice and your influence. Because together, we can make sure that polar bears roam the Arctic sea ice for generations to come.